the Dim Din Podcast, a safe space to talk about misconceptions, perceptions, assumptions, and frustrations. Join us for conversations and stories that explore how embracing our differences leads to a balanced, strong, and harmonious world. Hello, and welcome to the final episode of the Dim Din Podcast, Season 2. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe we have made it to eight more episodes of the Dim Din Podcast. You have stayed with us right through this journey and we are just so very grateful. We thought it best to bring you a special treat to end the session in a different way. And by that I mean today we are inviting two special guests all the way from Mama Salon to join us for this conversation. And before I tell you what we're going to talk about, I will pass it on to our guest here in Canada with me that is um, originally from Nigeria. And then we'll take turns with both of the guests that we have from, from Sierra Leone to introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Mr. Michael. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Michael Obonye. I'm um, from Nigeria. And um, I've been in the business of uh, addiction and substance uh, use uh, for over a decade, so I hope um, the contribution and the conversation we're going to have today will be of uh, immense uh, value to the brothers at home in uh, combating this problem. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah. And I was going to ask you for a fun or historical fact, but I would skip that. Because we've heard a lot about, <laughs> we've heard a lot from Nigerians, hey? Okay, we'll skip that. And we'll go over to Raphael. Can you please tell viewers a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Raphael Emmanuel David. I'm a Sierra Leonean by nationality. And uh, I've been working with so many organizations concerning the development of children and the youth as uh, a peace ambassador for um, the Sierra Leone adult education and uh, also the coordinator for the Love of Christ Foundation. I'm also the secretary and um, the IT officer for Strong Girls United Women dealing with um, women and girls in Sierra Leone. I'm a sign out student from the University of Management and Technology where I studied um, business information technology. Uh, for now, I would like to stop here and give the podium to my colleague. Beautiful resume you've got there. Beautiful. Okay, um, over to you, um, Alfred. Uh, good day, listeners, and uh, I am Alfred Jobanet, and. Uh, I hailed from Sierra Leone, West Africa, one of the most beautiful country in the world. What, what, what? And the most peaceful country <laughs> in the world at large. And um, I'm currently working with the Ministry of Information and also working with the Love of Christ Foundation as a safety general for the foundation. Um, we're dealing with persons with disability, the less privileged, and also imagine situations that are coming up that needs our assistance we normally come in, working with diverse organizations, but for now I only based with Love of Christ Foundation and the Ministry of Information. So I stop there for now. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, viewers, you know we have a treat coming your way today, and I know by now you're wondering, what are these people going to talk about today? And why did Miss Becker see the need to invite two people from Sierra Leone to join us for this conversation. Well, we'll show you a short clip on the issue of the day, and then we'll go on to why we're talking about it. Is it so for today? Who do 
today about what Kush really is, what the Kush crisis is, if there is one, and shed some light as into what we can do or what people are already doing to tackle this problem that could cause some serious issues for the future of Sierra Leone if we don't do something about it now. Hence, our addiction counselor here who has um, a, a lot of... Um, I'm experienced in that area, and two of the gentlemen who are joining us from Sierra Leone who are actively involved in supporting youth that have been um, affected by the Kush crisis in Sierra Leone. So how about we start with you, um, Raphael and Alfred. 
whoever wants to go first, can you tell us a little bit about the Kush crisis in Sierra Leone? And is it a crisis yet? Um, yeah, I think I should go first. Um, yeah, Kush has become a crisis now in Sierra Leone as I speak to you because um, it is drastically destroying the lives of youths in Sierra Leone. And um, since the start of this year, we've gotten an uh, increase in the rate of Kush intake in the country and more especially among youths. And so the government has declared it as a crisis in Sierra Leone and uh, we are fighting very hard to see how best we can be able to, to combat this epidemic in our country. And so definitely Kush in Sierra Leone presently is a crisis, looking at the rates of youths that are taking it and the rate of youths that are, that are dying every week. It, it has totally become a crisis in our country. And uh, one thing that we need to know about Kush drug is not like any other substance that one can take. The mixture we are getting here in Sierra Leone is different from other drugs in other countries. The Kush drugs, the, the mixture is very high. People use um, uh, cannabis, which is normally grown in Sierra Leone. They also use um, uh, fentanyl that they normally import. These are chemicals that they import. They also bring in formalin that they also import. They are chemical. They mix all of these things. And also, one of the devastating things that people need to know is that they don't just mix it with, um, with those chemicals, but they also mix it with dead bones, dead men bones. Oh. They also mixed it with dead men bones, and which is causing a lot and a lot of problem today in the country as a whole. And it's destroying the lives of youths. Once they take that particular drug, they don't, they don't um, um, be in a normal position. You find out that they have some swelling from their body parts. The, their body parts started decaying before they passed away. And so Kush is presently um, 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 a pandemic in our country, and it is a crisis as a, that has been declared by the government of Sierra Leone. Wow, wow. The bones of dead people? Michael, do you know anything about Kush? Yes, um, we have a... Um, thank you for, you know... Um, what you said about Kush and Sierra Leone so far. Um, uh, historically, uh, Kush in the Western world appears to be different from what uh, is seen in Sierra Leone today. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the opportunity of reading um, about uh, Kush in some other parts of Africa where they have to excavate dead bodies and, you know, um, extract the bone and the bone marrow, crush them to mix with uh, these substances. Yeah, as it is for Sierra Leone, I think the Kush in that part of the world is uh, uh, it mainly it can be tempted to be um, a polydrug mix. Polydrug mix in the sense that you're mixing a lot of um, um, drugs, um, uh, chemicals, um, you have uh, uh, cannabis, you have um, uh, fentanyl, you have um, tramadol, you have formaldehyde, and then also um, the excavated uh, bones from dead people. Um, so all that put together uh, it's good for us to have detailed information about the component, the consistency of that of Kush in Sierra Leone. Um, and that could also help us to uh, know more about uh, the impact it's having. I saw, I could, when I watched the videos that you guys sent, um, I, could, I was traumatized um, in terms of uh, how those young, younger boys were uh, you know, suffering. Uh, but one, there, there are some questions that um, I would like to ask uh, because we, right now, not enough studies have been done in this area. So 
uh, in terms of uh, how it's impacting the population, it appears to be impacting mainly the youth and young boys, boys. Uh, to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it is it impacting adults? Um, we don't, do we have that statistics? Um, that will probably help us to be able to um, start thinking of how to combat um, the epidemics as it's been declared so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, going on to you, Raphael, um, I, I, I know we have talked about, we had talked about some numbers and there was a recent article from an individual in um, UK that talked about um, dozens dying every week. Do you guys have some stats on those, um, like, on that specific detail? Um, initially, um, during the month of February, the Ministry of Health had um, a statistic number of um, youths, more especially youths and those who are involved in the kush that have been visiting the hospital, the government of hospitals per se. And it was ranging more than a thousand of youth who are being admitted there for drugs, for, for treatment per se. And um, the number of youth who are di that are dying um, because of this youth, uh, this Kush drug is rampant. It's so huge. For um, last year, from last year to this year, we, we, we lost more than um, 500 of youth. Statistically, if I can say the whole country and the whole nation, Sierra Leone, we lost more than that. So we are afraid of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So quite a bit of that, um, quite, quite a bit of people dying, but even accessing the the medical services as well, which this could um, end up being a major crisis to the economy as well, as bad as it is already. But let's talk about contributing factors. Because before I left Sierra Leone, addiction was not really a thing. And that was over 11 years ago. And addiction was not really something that people talked about. And even uh, now, I think there's still quite a heavy stigma on addiction and mental health. Let's talk about some contributing factors. Like, what do we think? Actually, before we talk about contributing factors, can you tell us a little bit about what addiction really is? Well, addiction is um, the inability uh, of an individual to function without the use yes. of. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, concerning the contributing factors. He's breaking. He's, yeah. He's hearing us a bit late. Just hold on a little bit, Raphael. Uh, Michael is just speaking to addiction. Yeah, so we, we, we're talking about addiction here, um, how people get addicted to the use of substances, uh, now particularly Kush. Um, we have to look at, um, at how did they get to start using drugs. Mm -hmm. Right, um, there are some uh, socioeconomic uh, problems that uh, need to be talked about. Um, this could also go as far as the uh, the level of uh, poverty, uh, where the government needs to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, kids, uh, the the young boys I saw there, uh, do they attend school? Are they in school? They're probably not in school, and uh, you want to see uh, how um, the how life is dealing with them. So the only thing they probably know is to co look for something to cope, mm -hmm. right? So and if Kush, my understanding is, uh, Kush is uh, Kush is very uh, cheap as it is there. Um, is it five leons, uh, which is um, about uh, twenty pence? Uh, for about uh, 40 joints of kush. Mm -hmm. So it's something that is relatively cheap, so they will, they will go for it because um, they don't know 
And it, they don't have some, they are not occupied. They don't have anything doing. You know, so, and then when they start doing, using it, it is very, very addictive. One of the, ad the two addictive com compounds there are the uh, marijuana and also um, uh, fentanyl. Mm -hmm. They are very addictive. Those are substances when you start using them, it is difficult to, to stay away from using them, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I, I think uh, to, to say that um, we, we cannot put this, the blame on the kids, so we, we need to actually look at why they even started using these drugs. Right, right. And that why is what we're going to come to. Thank you very much for speaking on um, the, the addiction piece as well. And from my own little um, background that I have in that aspect as well, it's important for viewers to know, and especially those in Sierra Leone, to know that there's a difference between use, misuse, um, abuse, and an addiction. Abuse and addiction can go hand in hand because you get to get 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 to a point where you physically feel like you cannot survive without the drugs. It starts to feel like food, like you need it to go on with your life. And at that point, some people argue that um, addiction is a disease, right? Because some people tend to say, well, you have a choice. You, you chose to start using it. So you might as well choose to stop using it if you want to. But like, like you said, some of those um, substances in that, that are laced in that drug are not as easy to just disconnect from when you want to. Um, yeah, but like, let, let's bring it down to contributing factors. And I know Raphael and Alfred, we had talked about some of the things that you're hearing directly from the youth as to what is influencing this decision to first of all start using before they get caught in this process. Can you tell us a little bit about contributing factors? Um, uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, one of the major factors one of the major contributing factors towards this school intake by the youth is a lack of job. A lack of job. And uh, we find out that Sierra Leone, we really have an uh, issue regarding job in our country. And uh, it's shocking that most of the youths that are involved in the intake of these drugs are graduates from university. They are graduates from university, most of them that we've intercepted with, that we've discussed with, and some of them that we normally talk to with and coached on the, on the way on how to escape this particular pandemic, most of them are graduates. And we found out that, and uh, being that the mind is idle, they are just sitting down doing nothing, they find a way of wherein they can at least engage themselves, peer pressure, meeting with groups, and so most of them get involved into the intake of drugs, just, just for them to be able to forget about their problems, forget about the economy around, and we all know Sierra Leone, presently the economy is very tough, and uh, so these are some of the things that makes most of them involved in the intake of drugs, and also lack of mental health awareness in the country. We find out that the country we really lack mental health awareness. We don't have the personnel, the capacity for people that are trained to really talk to us about our mental health, about our health status, about things that we really need to take or things that really, if we take them, will affect our mental state, status. We find out that we lack some of those things. For the whole of the year, maybe you have some mental health awareness on, on radio for just once a whole year which is very bad. And these are some of the reasons why some blindly enter into the intake of this kush, some blindly enter into the intake of drug addiction, and when they become addicted, for them to escape it, it's very difficult, and it will cost a lot, you see? So these are some of the contributing factor towards youth involving in this particular Beautiful, Push. beautiful. Thank you so much, Alfred. Is there anything you want to add, Raphael?
Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, in addition to what my colleague have said, Alfred, um, I think um, additionally, we have um, a week of law enforcement. Um, this is directly to the body that are responsible for the supervision of drugs that are being imported in the country. Um, for instance, um, during the time before Kush began to rampant, before Kush, the youth of this um, country, those who have died of it and those who are still taking it, those who have been affected of the Kush drug, and before they involved in it, they had the awareness that Kush is a deadly drug. So instead of them enforcing the, um, the, 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 the policy to, um, for the Kush drug to be stopped importing, and manufacturing because they are manufacturing Kush in our country. They're manufacturing the, the sales of Kush. They, they fail to do that at the early stage. So that leads to what um, 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 uh, that leads to what brings some of the youths on board in the intake of Kush that is killing them presently. And also in addition to that, peer pressure and inf social influence. And um, during our campaign, we had some of our, uh, uh, the youths that we interviewed during the campaign. We had some of the youths that we interviewed um, asking them, what really calls you to involve in this Kush taking? And they said, a peer pressure, influence by um, social um, um, gathering. So those are some of the contributing factors that are leading some of our youth and adults into Kush. Beautiful, beautiful. I like that yes. you touched on that piece about the importation and policies not being put in place at an earlier stage to sort of like uh, minimize importation. Because um, because I think that's a big piece and that leads to like that question of who stands to gain in this crisis. Even though it may be a crisis, yeah. there are people who I think stand to gain from this. And this is a very dicey area, but I'm all the way in Canada, so maybe I can talk about it. <laughs> Before they find me, it probably will be too long. But is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'm happy. Raphael did say something about, uh, in terms of the contributing factors, he mentioned about um, uh, no jobs for people and all that, uh, which is very true. Uh, when you look at those, uh, the, the videos that I watched about those young boys, mm -hmm. you can tell that these are, these are just victims. Absolutely. They are victims. So, uh, but the, the, the key players, like you mentioned, there are no jobs and so stuff like that. When you mention no jobs, who are the, what's the population that we're looking at? We're looking at people who have graduated from the university mm -hmm. and they don't have jobs but there's an outlet for them to get involved in this, um, this maybe the making of Kush and so because they're going to make, but it's a kind of, it's job, an outlet for job for them. So they make money from it, okay? But who are the victims? They are not the victims because it's an outlet for them. They have put it into their lives. They've gone to school and there are no jobs. So if they can lay hands on these chemicals coming from wherever it is in the world, and they're able to put it together to make kush, they make the drugs. They're going to sell the drugs. Then the, the weight of the economy on the younger ones that we are seen as a victim here, they don't have an outlet. So they, they seek that euphoria mm -hmm. to be able to deal with that economic pressure. And that is what leads them to engage in the use of kush. Now it is cheap, but when you look at it, when they buy those drugs, the graduates who don't have jobs, they that are selling the drugs, they make money. So they make life, they stand to gain from Absolutely. it. Why these youth stand to lose? Because they are dying in numbers. It's a lose-lose situation yeah. for them. Um, talking about um, education and the lack of it, um, Let's see if I can refresh my memory on like the stages of um, um, like the five different stages in addiction and stuff or getting treatment. I think the first one is pre-contemplation, contemplation, 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 preparation, action, and maintenance. Yay! <laughs> 
So like those five stages are usually for those of us who are um, involved in the professional support of um, addiction here. Those are some of the things that we try to educate people who are struggling with that um, on so that they are aware which stage they are and which stage they need to be to sort of like get through or get out of that circle. Um, and so you both are involved in the treatment aspects of things as well. But from the conversation that I had with you, you are approaching it more from like a, a religious concept. Are there any treatment facilities in the country at all with this being a crisis in the country right now? All right. Um, so that area, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure we only have two rehabilitation centers for that. And one is at the Kissy Chris Yard, which is um, um, that um, uh, rehabilitation center cannot uh, accommodate up to 100 um, youth, I mean victims. So, and then they recently opened another one at Hastings, another rehabilitation center. But the, the, the way they are approaching these victims for them to stop um, is not commensurable to the way we did during our previous two campaigns we, we, we held. We have been camping them for five days a week um, continuously. We will sensitize them. We will teach the word of God to them. We will tell them why they need to be sober-minded and stop taking this Kush drug and the effect of Kush drug and the dangers, what it will, uh, the, the dangers it will create if they continue taking the Kush drug. And for the rehabilitation centers, they only give them um, paracetamol and release them. They will go there, check, do tests. They say, oh, for instance, you have, um, uh, you have been diagnosed as um, intensive Kush taker. And then you, they prescribe drugs. And the, the drugs that they are prescribing will not be sufficient for them. So we thought it fits that we start our own at initial we had the at initial we started it we started it before government started um doing the rehab center but because of fun lack of fun that is why we 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 couldn't be able to to have a rehab center for that but we do camp them for okay a week. okay so you have a program that supports them for a week. You try to educate them. You try to understand what, what, what is getting them into use. And uh, you preach the word of God to them. And sort of like, has that, is that yielding good results? Like, are you seeing good outcomes from what you've been doing? Yes, we see good outcomes. We have um, some of the victims who we are, uh, we can say, um, survivors. We call them the survivors, the survivors from this Kush drug. We have some of them who are presently working. We have testimony of few. Some of, uh, have traveled out of the country. Some are working in um, big institutions like the, the, the bank, the banking sectors. Some are working. Some are presently going to school again. Some are being reunited with their families as well. They are sober-minded doing their business. Okay. okay. What can we pass on to our viewers today that would be helpful? Um, I would like to start from um, uh, the fact that um, the, you guys are... Uh, thank you so much that you guys for all the efforts you have put in and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But there has to be... Uh, properly uh, structured uh, rehabilitation program in place. Um, by that, uh, there has to be um, just the 100 uh, bed st structure for a place like that. That's like um, a grain of sand in a bucket. Um, you need more. And as much as I praise your effort for all you're doing, um, the government need to step up to support you guys. Mm -hmm. um, 
when I said uh, uh, properly structured uh, uh, resource programs, those programs are going to be geared towards, uh, you know, taking on assessment, you know, assess the kids, because you need to know where they are. You know, you have to meet these kids where they are. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get there is to do some assessment with them. And then when you deter you're able to determine where they are at the stage of change, if any, because they could be pre-contemplative. So if they are pre-contemplative, what do you do? You just need to continue to motivate them towards making changes, Change. right? Mm -hmm. So um, if, but if you're able to get them there, uh, that's uh, a huge progress. Then we start looking at, okay, how do we maintain, uh, what, what are the strategies that you can put in place? That's so you st start talking about how do you deal with the cravings? How do you deal with um, uh, the triggers? You know, uh, but you will have to really assess them to that point and know where they are in the stage of change to be able to uh, introduce those, those tools. Tools to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if they are in the pre-contemplation stage, then it's more about encouraging uh, edu them. Uh, more education. More education as to why they should consider change. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there should be a grassroots campaign, in a campaign tailored towards all the side effects from things that we saw in those videos. Mm -hmm. uh, bring, them, bring them in, uh, use it as, a, uh, as an intensive campaign to educate the people. Mm -hmm. So because uh, information is very, very key. So part of that um, uh, properly structured uh, rehabilitation program could also include information session because we're also looking at a generational change. That's what we're looking for. It's a big one. So if you want to achieve that, uh, you, you might want us also want to target the population that has not even started using Kush. Yes. Yes. Right? So they need to have that information because when they have information is power mm -hmm. when they have that then we know that okay yeah there's we are making some progress but yeah. as to those who are already involved in the use of coach um how do we help them um, right. motivational uh you know motivational interviewing, interviewing. um uh, giving them incentives. Uh, I know you, you, uh, from what we said so far that uh, uh, approaching it from uh, the Christian perspective, you, you know what, somebody who doesn't have food to eat, it's, it's a very difficult thing for the person to deal with mm -hmm. life pressure. So the only thing they, that, the only way they can deal with that hopelessness is to look for something to kill the pain, yeah. you know. Yeah. So if we can continue to campaign, you know, uh, encourage them in the direction of the risk involved in what they are doing and they are able to see it then we can tap in with other resource tools such as uh, you know strategies to cope, coping strategies, um, uh, triggers, cravings and all others. And, okay. and while, while we're on that topic I was chatting with a few youth that are because there's another treatment program in um, Lungi um, and there were a few youth there that I was chatting with, just trying to support from a distance. And the question they, they had asked is, okay, we have come to this rehabilitation program for months, and now we are going back to that familiar um, environment, to the familiar people, to those things that drew us to use, right? And now we are worried that we may not be able to maintain the sobriety that we have gained when we get back to that environment. Talking about um, relapse prevention and stuff. Yeah. Can you give them any tips as to what to look for, how to maintain sobriety, what to stay away from, who to stay away from? So yeah, that is uh, great. If I uh, haven't attained that level in recovery, mm -hmm. um, one thing you want to guard against is uh, relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I you remember when I mentioned uh, introdu introducing the tools of uh, dealing with cravings and triggers. Mm -hmm. That is where it's most important to use. Mm -hmm. So now because you don't want the kids to go back to what they were doing, what you have achieved, you don't want to let go of that. And the only way to be able to uh, keep that is to teach them how 
to uh, use those tools, for example. Um, how did they start using Kush? Do you go, uh, it could be, uh, you have to work on their senses. Is it smell? Uh, is it an environment where they, they started using, you know, memory situations, things that will bring them back to how they started? You want to avoid all that. So if there are places where they, where they went to when they started using this drug, they have to avoid those places, right? And um, in terms of uh, cravings, mm -hmm. what are the things that you can do um, when uh, you're, uh, you're having that strong craving to use? Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many things uh, people use um, based on what they have within them. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, some people will go and engage in some physical activities um, as easy as it is like going to, to walk, you know, going for runs with dogs, you know. Um, or running uh, after dogs, uh, yeah, which we do so, so, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, there's so many things you can do, <laughs> but they might sound very little, but when you bring, when they, you bring them together, it makes it, it adds up a lot to, to be able to help them in the regards of dealing with triggers and uh, cravings. Beautiful, beautiful. So your environment, changing your circle, being yeah. mindful of who you interact with, um, little things to help you during the craving process because cravings do come and go. Like they are not here to stay, right? So if you allow yourself to like um, walk through it, then before you know it, it's come and gone. Um, before I take it over to you for our final questions here as we're rounding up. Just want to send a quick shout out to Sincunia Community Organization Development for supporting me throughout this whole podcast um, sessions by giving us a beautiful space to work with you all are the best if you don't know about Sincunia Community um, Development Organization here in Canada. They are an organization that work primarily with uh, immigrant youth and children and families, helping them to settle and to keep that cultural aspect of the countries that they are from. They are an amazing. If you haven't um, heard of them yet, think about joining, bringing your children. Okay, so now coming back to you, let's talk about the way forward. I know we have uh, five minutes here, maybe ten. Um, Let's have a way forward. What are you guys, you guys have talked about some of what you're doing. Talk about, tell us about how we can support you, hold hands with you as a team to continue the good work that you're doing already. And, uh, all right. And uh, I believe this platform really has exposed a lot of things. And uh, we also learned from your discussion too of you from Mr. Michael. And um, the way forward in combating push, and uh, there is a very important thing that we need to know. Why is dealing with those who have already involved into the intake of Kush, we we'll also try to deal with those who have not yet involved into the intake of Kush. They might be probably in the end of involving into it if we forget to sensitize them. So the way forward one is continuous sensitization programs on the danger of drugs. Uh, we raise the awareness on mental health issues. I think that was one. Then the, secondly, we need to work on more rehabilitation center in the country because um, presently those that are having rehabilitation centers in the country are individuals with just small community um, and based organizations. People come together, they say, all right, let's work on having a rehabilitation center so that we can help sanitize our community. These are the way people open some small, small rehabilitation centers that they are working with. And also, we also have been trying very hard. We've already secured a land. We are in want to put up a construction for a rehabilitation center, whilst we are also working on our various monthly programs where in the camp, those who are involved in the intake of push, we make sure we sensitize them, we counsel them, we treat them because we have some staff that are medically inclined, those who are trained for that particular purpose who are mental health workers, we invite them, they come to our aid, 
to come and render treatments to those who are involved in isolated of drugs. And uh, we also need funding. Funding is, is really a problem in, in most of those um, um, community-based organizations. Most as we have interacted with, they always complain about funding. Fund on how to get medication, medicines, treatment for, for those who have already involved into the intake of food, funding on feeding, because when you feed them, they, you, make, you make sure you feed them three times a day and take good care of them so that at the end of the day, they will be able to recover at a very fast and, and pace. And uh, these are some of the issues, and also we need also training because most of the people that are working at the rehabilitation centers, they are not medical practitioners. They don't have that knowledge on how to treat people who are involved in the intake of drugs. They need to be trained on how to, to counsel people who are really involved into the intake of drugs, all of these things. These are some of the things that really, we really want and really want if you can have help from any place, because we really have challenge, you can write. We, we've been writing to government for assistance, for help, but to no avail. And because the government itself, they also are fighting also with their um, 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 little programs that they've set up on how to combat schools and how to get funding. And we also we also need funding on how to be able to combat schools and see that. We have a, a, a very um, 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 sane community, a community that is free from drug addiction and that is free from the decay beautiful, that is beautiful. in our country. Beautiful, this beautiful. Thank you so much, um, Alfred, and thank you for your contribution to all the amazing work you are doing. Any final words, Raphael? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in addition to what my colleague have said, I think um, we the government have to strengthen the law enforcement um, because, um, like I said earlier on, um, if they don't stop the importing, the manufacturing, and the sales of Kush in our country, um, we will try our best, but it will never stop. And also, um, they should create an economic opportunity, not only... Um, creating offices for youth to be employed, but um, entrepreneurship fund, like a source of loan for um, graduate students. Yeah, so those graduate students will have a source of fund so that they can start their own business or their own company for themselves. I believe most developing countries, they had um, um, such thing like that, for um, creating um, a fund so that um, the, the, the students who are graduating or those who are still in, in the university will have their own um, way of generating fund and income so that they they, they, they will be so pushing beautiful. down the stress. Beautiful. Thank mentally. you so very much, so Raphael. Any last words from you, Michael? Well, uh, I'll say you guys should keep up the good work. Um, uh, I, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see from our end here uh, all the support we can provide, uh, which has already started, we we'll, won't we'll hold back. We'll, we'll see to that. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. Uh, another final shout out to African Center for supporting the Dim Dim podcast. And of course, to you, my beautiful Joyce, for this beautiful makeup that you helped me with to round up our season. As you have heard our conversation, very emotional, very sensitive, but very relevant. I love what Raphael said about um, putting together funds for youth that are coming, that are graduating from the university. Because if they have something to tap um, into and establish themselves, that might reduce the complaints about job crisis in the country and honestly bring more revenue to the country. And that's for us diasporans, all Sierra Leoneans who are calling you on board. Join hands with us. And all the Nigerians, all the Africans, <laughs> join hands with us. Let us tackle this crisis because today it's Sierra Leone. Tomorrow it could be another country if we don't work together to resolve this issue that we have at hand. 
Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to put on, uh, um, put up the Dindin podcast um, email address. If you want to contact us, to join hands with us, to ask more questions, or to know how to move forward with this, you are welcome to do so via that email um, address. Thank you again for staying with us through two seasons. It's not the end. Season three will definitely come sometime soon. But until then, I am your host, uh, Becca, a.k.a. The Serenadian. And Sabe, Sandy Mdim. Sabe, Sandy Mdim.